Hello and welcome to the second webinar in the Improving Restorations Spring 2024 series, a collaboration between University of Minnesota Extension and the Legacy Fund Restoration Evaluation Program. The theme of this series is climate and restorations, and today's topic is on forest restorations and climate adaptation. I have a few things to cover from the webinar hosts, and then we will get to our speakers for the day. I'm Carly Wagner with the Minnesota DNR, also on behalf of the Board of Water and Soil Resources, working on the Legacy Fund Restoration Evaluation Program. We collaborate with experts to evaluate and learn from restorations and share information to improve future restorations in formats such as this webinar series. If you want to learn more about ecological restoration, our partners at U of M Extension offer an ecological restoration certificate program. This is a great resource for continued learning, and I would encourage early career professionals as well as seasoned practitioners to check out this program. During the webinar today, we will have time for Q&A after both speakers have presented. We ask that you please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions and be sure that we see them. You can use the chat feature if you're having technical difficulties or for more general discussion. Julia Bonin from the U of M will be facilitating the Q&A. After the presentation today, you will receive a prompt to fill out a sh short survey. Please consider doing so. We would love to hear from you on what you're getting out of these webinars and for potential future topics to cover in this series. If you miss something, don't worry. These webinars are being recorded and will be available on the Restoration Webinar website. Please join us for the last two webinars in this series on climate and restorations on April 11th on climate contingency planning for restorations, and on April 25th on the topic of seed sourcing and a discussion of local mix and match and assisted migration. Now to introduce our speakers for today, Dr. Marcella Windmiller Campioni is an associate professor in the Department of Forest Resources at the U of M Twin Cities campus. In her work, she explores how conventional and alternative forest management approaches can be used to increase forest resistance and resilience to current and future threats. Today, she'll be talking about the role of silviculture in forest restoration. Neil Slifka, our second presenter, is an area resource specialist with the Minnesota DNR Parks and Trails Division in the Southern region. His work focuses on habitat management, restoration, and environmental review. Today, he will be talking about climate change, tree mortality, and adaptive management at Nurse Strand Big Woods State Park. And with that, I will open up our floor to Marcella to give the first presentation of the day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carly. Okay. Just want to make sure folks are seeing that okay and hearing me okay. Looks great. Awesome. Thanks, Julia. Um, well, good afternoon, and thanks for uh, taking some time during uh, the noon hour. Um, I'm really excited to talk about the role of silviculture and forest restoration. Um, my email as well as lab Instagram are on there. Um, so if folks have additional questions or want to reach out to talk about anything, please, please feel free to connect. So let's first talk about what is silviculture and defining that. So silviculture is the art and science of controlling the establishment of growth, composition, health, quality of forest and woodlands to meet the diverse needs and values of landowners and society on a sustainable basis. So really silviculture is how and why we manage the forest and it takes into account this long history and understanding, especially um, if we think about this from a Western lens, but knowing that um, forest management, forest um, actions have been done in the United States and in the North American continent by people for thousands of years. People have been managing our forest ecosystems for thousands of years. Um, from a Western lens, we have this really strong foundation of uh, knowledge that um, over a hundred, close to two, like close to 150 years old. And we use that knowledge in combination with art, which is this idea of how we understand the forest, that each forest is unique, each situation is unique, and how we understand the forest is this combination of aspects that we could never know exactly 
all the pieces, all the all the nuance, all the complexity. And that really uh, takes into account the art of how we understand, how we know a forest, how we under how we manage a forest and make decisions. And we do that, our decisions are related to the how and why. And as we think about the silviculture, some of our earlier definitions from a Western science perspective um, date back over a hundred years and really relate to this understanding of establishment, development, reproduction, same kind of definition we have from 2008. And it really just depends on its intelligent practice on the principles of silvics. And so silvics is the study of the life history. Um, I like to sometimes describe it as the personality of a species or plant. And so how we know that plant, how that regenerates, how it relates to both um, who it is as an individual tree, but also how that tree relates to other species, uh, disturbances, all those aspects. And silvix is something that changes over a lifetime of a species. So who a tree species is as a seedling um, might be a little different than who it is as a large overstory tree. So things about shade tolerance, things about water and drought tolerance, all those aspects relate to how we know a species, how we understand the species and silvix, which is really that root word of silviculture. Um, so just kind of really uh, driving home the point that silviculture is really based on ecology of our understanding and we use that then to determine management actions or no action both of those are aspects and so um a concept within silviculture is really that we can take a triad approach to forest land and um this is by uh colleagues bob seymour um and thinking that there's lots of different ways and reasons we might manage a forest. And some of those are at the extremes of a high yield plantation. So really controlled um, with the goal of maximizing that return. There's also really good options of ecological reserves. So allowing the processes that are in place to be part of that system and define that stand development and explore that stand development. And then there's this middle or new forestry or alternative silviculture or adaptive silviculture or restoration silviculture. All those terms relate to um, where forestry is uh, mostly is thinking about how we consider the whole range of uh, ecosystem values, the whole range of uh, values as a human society. And what does that look like as we think about trade-offs as we think about what does this look like on the landscape? So how do we incorporate ecological com complexity, climate adaptation, uh, disturbance resilience, all those pieces within this concept of new forestry? And so um, this triad approach really accounts for that. All these pieces are part of our landscape of forestry. All these pieces provide really valuable components of how we understand forestry, how we interact with forests, uh, and thinking about forests as um, these really complex systems that also provide renewable resources. And so within silviculture and within the silvicultural system, we often break it down into three parts, regeneration, intermediate treatment and our regeneration harvest. Um, and there's some other aspects on uh, the other side of like breaking those down further. We will talk about uh, natural versus artificial regeneration and the different regeneration methods, but really all three of these parts are part of a silvicultural system. So if you're hearing someone just talk about removing trees without an intent, then that's not silviculture, that's just extractive practices. Silviculture really is this thoughtful approach to if we are removing a tree through a harvest, why are we doing that? What is the next step? What Who is coming in next? How are we maintaining resilience of the trees that are there? There are really intentional um, practices. And so we remove trees to allow for the species that are there or are going to be there, never removing trees without that thought. And we do these practices in an adaptive management cycle. So we do this um, thoughtful planning because uh, folks that are working in forests know just how long-lived forests are. And so 
the actions that are taken at 5, 10, 20 years that we're planning really need to be put into context of these long-lived um, individuals, trees, and these long-lived ecosystem processes that are really part of this component. Um, so we're always planning, doing, adjusting, and learning, and that's really done over a lifetime of a forest. And so that's talking about multiple generations of foresters often being part of this adaptive management process together. And so I really want to talk about this regeneration piece. And so uh, regeneration is often uh, broken down into natural or artificial. And so when we think about natural regeneration, this is establishment of plants or plant age classes from seeding, sprouting, suckering, or layering. So this can be either sexual regeneration or asexual regeneration. Both are common in tree species. A tree species can sometimes do both, um, sometimes do both at the same location, um, which is really, really cool. Um, but it's that regeneration um, that's done through propagals that are getting to the site without human mediation. And so that can be through the seed rain. So seed coming down from site, seed coming in from other places, from the seed bank um, and all these pieces. And I really, really uh, think this um, diagram with that kind of dormant seed bank and seed rain is really wonderful because it shows um, how many aspects are influencing um, how we get seed and what how that looks from both above, below, um, and other aspects related to predation, uh, senescence um, that allow seeds to grow. And then if we go into the regeneration triangle, so the thing is, silviculturists, we love triangles. We love the, like, we love triangles. We love regeneration triangles. We love uh, three parts of a silvicultural systems. Um, it's really, we, we like threes. Um, and so our natural regeneration triangle really accounts for these aspects of like, we need a seed bed. So where is the seed uh, falling? So what is uh, what does that look like? Is that mineral soil? Is that duff? Does that need to have a nurse object? Uh, what is the seed supply? So where is the seed coming in from? And um, taking that from, is it seed rain? Is it the seed bank? Where is that coming in from? And the environmental condition. So both those uh, longer term um, weather kind of climatic events, as well as that microsite. So what are we looking at that year? Do we have a warm spring, a wet spring, a dry spring? Do we get a summer drought? All those relate to regeneration. And so it's pretty amazing. I like to say that like all of these pieces come together for successful regeneration. And so as a silviculturist, um, when we're thinking about natural regeneration, we can influence some aspects. So we can influence the seed bed through our treatment. So we can think about how we're managing it or scarifying or not scarifying or leaving nurse objects or leaving residual trees, um, which can also relate to the seed supply and a little bit on that microenvironment, but we really don't have a lot of control over environmental factors. So um, we can do all the best treatments, all set the stand up for success, but if we have a really severe drought or if we have a really severe flood, that's gonna be the overriding factor. So silviculturists are really, every time we come together, every time we're out there, we're always thinking about what are these factors and how do we successfully get regeneration? Um, artificial regeneration is using young trees created by direct seeding or planting seedlings or cuttings and putting those intentionally in the ground. And so as we think about climate adaptation, as we think about restoration, artificial regeneration or this use of uh, human mediated regeneration techniques through intentional planting or seeding um, is another really, really important tool that can increase structure, can increase complexity, can provide species diversity. And so uh, I want to pull up this question as a poll just to, we've been, I think I've been talking for about eight or nine minutes. So um, Chelsea, if we can launch that poll, so if folks can uh, take a minute. So what are some variables that can influence regeneration negatively that you've observed? Select all that apply. 
And for the other, please feel free to place that in the chat. It would be wonderful to hear what folks are seeing, observing, um, and kind of thinking about as they're thinking about regeneration. Awesome, thanks, Heather. Fire suppression is one of them. We'll give folks maybe another 30 seconds to vote and then we can see what folks are seeing. Planting the wrong species. Okay, great. Thanks, Craig. Climate change, awesome. Thank you, Sierra. Rising water levels from beaver dams or logging in wet swamps that reduce evaporation. Okay, so changing in those water conditions. Okay, let's see what folks, how folks are, uh, what folks have responded. Yep, lack of fire as a negative. Yep, 100%. Um, so deer, really common, um, and other herbivores are really common um, aspects of impacts to regeneration, other plants weather, location. Um, thanks for sharing. Um, and so we're going to, these are all aspects as we think about regeneration, as we think about different tools, as we different talk about different things, uh, uh, different aspects. And I think um, Neil's maybe going to touch even more on some of these things in this next part. Okay. So some folks mentioned climate change. Yep. Climate change is, the climate is changing we're seeing that impact both in terms of changes in temperature, changes in precipitation pattern. These pieces are really impacting how our ecosystems in the Great Lakes in Minnesota are going to be experiencing the growing season and, and not growing season. And so within uh, one of the projects I work with is called the Adaptive Silviculture for Climate Change Network, which is this international network across the United States and Canada, really aimed at exploring um, alternative methods related to silviculture and forest management. And I'm going to touch on Crosby Farm, which I'm the lead on. So that's right in the Twin Cities. It's an urban floodplain ecosystem. And so within the system, um, and within this larger experiment, the goals are really uh, looking at within each of these different locations across each of these forests using the same framework. So resistance, resilience, and transition. So resistance, really thinking about how we maintain improved defenses and um, continue relatively unchanged conditions. So what are treatments that we can do to come up, almost push back or resist climate change? Resilience allows some of that accommodation of change, but really maintaining kind of the ecological um, integrity of that forest, but just widening out that. And transition is acknowledging change is happening. Uh, what our forests are going to look like in the future are going to be really different. How do we help facilitate or steward that change and enable ecosystems to, to respond to new and changing conditions? And so these represent a range of like um, action and also a range of risk. And so within the Crosby Farm experiment, within um, our floodplain forest of uh, Minnesota, we're seeing huge impacts from emerald ash borer and the resulting change of how these ecosystems are functioning when we lose overstory green ash. So in the floodplains uh, of Crosby Farm, some of those areas contain 95% of the overstory trees as green ash. So huge changes in our overstory ecosystem. And so you're seeing that mortality in that picture and these wide gaps. This is also a banner year from cucumber when I took the picture. Um, so just this is during uh, still the growing season. So the overstory is all dead and we're seeing that loss of a forest canopy. And with that loss of a forest canopy, we're also seeing a lack of regeneration. And some folks might be looking in the picture and being like, no, no, I see plenty of silver maple. And you're right, every year, uh, often post flooding, we get a flush of new silver maple seedlings. However, those seedlings are never sticking around. So they're not moving from regeneration or germination into recruitment. And so with that, we designed an experiment really trying to capture this idea. We're not getting 
recruitment. We're not getting those trees moving from a seedling class into the overstory. Why might that be? And how do we think about this under a climate adaptive lens? So we use a resistance, resilience, and transition framework, as well as a control. So all of uh, these areas were fenced. So each of these uh, circular plots are fenced with eight foot tall fencing um, to account for herbivory like deer as well as beaver um, and then plant it. And so um, you'll notice where these locations fall. Those are all the areas of really high ash mortality. So using um, the ash mortality as a base for our experiment to see how do we recruit into the overstory. And so we use artificial regeneration, so really uh, bare root planting stock. Um, and our goal was really large planting stock. So uh, the Mississippi, um, not uh, last year, we saw really high flooding um, and some of those areas were greater than uh, 10 feet. And so our goal was if we plant really large trees greater than six foot, can we keep them above water? And we planted these trees using uh, volunteers. So a hundred or 1,100, 1,100 trees were planted by volunteers um, on a 10 by 10 spacing. Every location was marked and we have eight foot tall fencing. And so over the last three years, uh, we've been monitoring survival. We just wrapped up 2023 data entry um, and seeing that across these different, uh, across the experiment, we had really pretty good survival. Um, our transition had a little bit lower survival, and um, some of that might have been done due to seed stock. So those trees came on a train uh, during the pandemic, and so they were likely dead when we planted them. Um, but our others, but we did replant in 2021, and are seeing some of that uh, bounce back. And so we're also these are the species that we planted. So we planted a wide mix of species, kind of fulfilling this idea of resistance, resilience, and transition. And so this is just a subset of those species. And one of the pieces I want to highlight really quickly is that in this experiment, we're seeing that there are options. There are options for which species we can plant, which species can survive, and how we think about um, goals and objectives and level of risk or like what that looks like from species within our resistance framework, so maintaining to our transition of thinking about what future climate will look like. And so silviculture and forest restoration is really this link of how we use these silvicultural tools of how structure and composition shift with or without management and how we think about our treatments based on timing, type, intensity, and sequence. And we can use these treatments to meet our management goals. And restoration is increasingly one of those goals. So how do we restore an overstory to maintain uh, water quality, wildlife habitat, all those aspects. And so uh, I want to thank folks for listening. And again, feel free to reach out. And um, thanks for having me right now. And I look forward to questions at the end. Thank you, Marcella. Great to hear about the intersection between silviculture and restoration. I think it's a great way to think about things. With that being said, let's transition to Neil Slipka to give us a topical example from Big Nursery and Wood State Park. Hi, everybody. Um, hopefully you can see my, my screen here. Um, somebody wants to confirm. Looks great. All right, thank you. Uh, so, yep, I'm Neil Slipka. I'm with the Minnesota DNR Division of Parks and Trails. Today, I'm just going to be going through more of a, a case study of some adaptive planting trials we did at Nurse Strand Big Woods State Park uh, in response to some um, tree mortality that we, we had on a pretty large scale uh, relative to the size of the park. Um, so I'll go through a little bit of background on that and then um, kind of go into some of the um, adaptive management that we did to try to, um, to address some of that. So just a little background. Um, 
Moon Strand Big Woods State Park falls in the, the Oak Savannah subsection. Uh, it's a pretty characteristic big woods, maple basswood forest. Uh, if you can see the outlined area in bold, it falls about two thirds the way up on that western edge. So it's right in that transition. Um, you know, this these forest types, these big wood forest types, kind of a, these mesic hardwood forest types occur on these um, uh, on soils that develop on calcareous till till deposits left after glaciation, um, as well as less windblown silts that uh, um, were uh, accumulating along these these edges, um, and that'll play a big part in kind of this discussion. Um, so uh, as I said, uh, this is characteristic big woods, the site. Um, it's comprised of mainly basswood, red and white oak, sugar maple, and elm. So um, we all kind of have a picture in our heads of, of these types of these types of forests. They've got a pretty rich ephemeral community um, within the Oak Savannah subsection. Um, more broadly, we've got 93 species of greatest conservation need. Uh, in Nurse Strand Big Woods, we've got a couple species that are, are listed species, one being um, uh, the dwarf trout lily. Um, that's a federally listed species. So just a little background is um, some of the threats of <clears throat> to to this subsection overall and and as well as to the big woods subsection, uh, which lies to the north, in, include habitat loss due to agriculture, uh, deer overpopulation or bivory, mesification or this kind of feedback loop, uh, whereby through loss of things like fire, um, these conditions uh, within the forest tend to trend more um, more wet or mesic, uh, and that kind of feeds back into what species occur there. Um, and then a couple big things that we'll be addressing here are um, invasive species, uh, which as Marcella pointed out, emerald ash borer, which doesn't, as far as we know, what currently occur in the park, but it's something that we need to plan around. And the second, which we are currently uh, kind of dealing with is the impacts of climate change. So again, this picture on the left shows a, a typical uh, southern mesic hardwood forest, a native plant community type would be M MHS 39, and that's a, a, a this kind of typical maple basswood forest. So just a little background on the park, it was established in 1945 formally, uh, within its statutory boundaries encompasses about 2,800 acres, um, 1,400 of which are forested, and it encompasses a portion of the, the headwaters of the Prairie Creek drainage, and um, it likely owes a lot of its current conditions, the stand conditions, to its past land use over the past hundred or so years, and the picture on the left shows um, at the turn between the 1850s and the turn of the century, how those two sections, section nine and 16, which comprise the majority of the park, were divided up into roughly 150 or so, 145 woodlots. These were family woodlots for people who lived in the nearby community of Nurse Strand. Uh, they would pasture these, they would um, you know, cut subsistence wood off them. So we get a lot of coppice grown red oak, um, you know, elm was a big component. Uh, along the edges, we even had butternut, which is now a state endangered tree and uh, is is disappearing from the landscape. But um, but a lot of maple um, and basswood have have uh, have come to dominate these stands, but also a really healthy oak oak component. <clears throat> so just getting into what we were dealing with and what we were kind of having to. Um, to, uh, to address was in about 2016, we started noticing that as spring approached into summer, that the, the overstory canopy was, was not flushing out and these trees were in fact dead. Um, so when we started to look at it, and as you'll see in the next slide, we ended up mapping these areas with the GPS unit and, you know, kind of tracking the, the boundary, which was a, a extremely apparent. Um, is that uh, we had upwards of 200 acres of um, complete over, almost complete overstory loss, and it was happening across species. So it was not species specific. We were seeing, 
maples, oaks, basswoods, hickories, um, yellow bud or a bitter nut hickory, all, all kind of succumbing to whatever this was. Um, and the, the regeneration was almost exclusively um, ash, green ash. Um, we do have a black ash component, but most of the regeneration was green ash. So, and as I pointed out, it was almost total canopy loss. We estimate over 75%, but if you took out a spherical densiometer and did a more, um, a more rigorous measurement of, of uh, canopy coverage, you would, you'd probably get more on the lines of 90 to 95%. So in 2017, we ended up mapping these areas uh, again, that forested area is all the park, uh, 1,400 acres. The yellow hashed area <clears throat> comes out to about 200. Um, and as you see here, this is uh, increment board white oak. Uh, we had these um, interpretive signs placed on all these trees. Uh, I think there was nine of them, uh, different species characteristic of the park. Uh, this picture was taken in uh, 28, 2017, and it was an almost 200 year old tree. And by the following growing season, it was dead. Um, so as, as you can see, a picture on the left shows a uh, color infrared image, uh, just showing, and it's not the best image, but it does kind of show red areas of living canopy, gray areas um, would be areas that uh, the canopy was, was no longer functional, I guess. Um, and as you can see, those mapped areas correspond to those those gray areas. So it, it kind of drove the question, what's happening? So we started to put this in kind of a landscape context. Uh, next one is, this is a LIDAR image with those areas overlaid. And you can see that um, those yellow hashed areas fall on a very level, essentially flat, you know, 2% or less slope. Um, area of the park. It is one of the highest areas in the park, but it is also very, very level. Um, you can see areas where uh, some of the drainage ways are between the yellow cross hatching. That's where we're getting, um, we've got some, some gullying and we've got some lateral release of water. Um, those areas are intact and they're pretty, pretty much uh, cookie cutter around, around those drainage ways. So, just in order to better, better diagnose what we had, we, we called our, our uh, forest health specialist from the DNR, Brian Schwingle. He came out in 2018 and gave us an assessment um, that pointed to uh, a diagnosis of repeated root zone flooding during the growing season. So we had hypoxic or anoxic conditions. Um, these roots, these trees weren't breathing essentially over the course of of the early growing season. And the early growing season is a period, I think, when um, these trees are a lot more susceptible to flood impacts. Uh, so, so he observed dieback and mortality on larger, more mature trees, um, evidence of stress in the trees, water-related stress. Um, and these were occurring, uh, as I said earlier, over 75% of the mature canopy. The sapling layer was unaffected and most of that came down to the fact that it was dominated by um, ash, green ash regeneration. So as I said, ash um, and to a lesser extent elm, the lingering elm that we have was doing better than other species. So why is this happening? Well, it turns out that these level areas were not draining. Um, so and we were losing up to 15% of the park's forested area. And it turns out that there is about a 24 to 36 inch uh, layer of soil that developed over this lust layer, this windblown silt layer that lies over what they call old gray, old gray till, which is um, near strain falls on the edge of that uh, quote unquote driftless region in Minnesota. Well, people will say there is no true driftless uh, in Minnesota, and this old gray till was from previous glaciations, not this last this last glacial episode, but it's older, it's very dense, clay, 
uh, as till often is, but it's very close to the surface in this case. So we were hypothesizing that increased growing season precipitation over the last decade or so was resulting in these large scale die off patterns. So we started to put together some co-op data. Um, luckily, we've got a long record over 100 years or 120 years or so at, at Nurse Strand and in the Faribault area. And what we were seeing was that if we looked at precipitation since 1990, especially over the last 10, 15 years or so, that we were getting a, a, a big increase, relatively big increase over the historic period of 1900 to to uh, 1990. So as you can see here on this slide, we've got it plotted out. But what we're ending up with is more, uh, more days with one plus inch or these mega rainfall events. And we've got a 19% increase in um, annual precipitation um, since 1990 as compared to the historic record from 1900 to 1989. Uh, similarly, growing season precipitation in that period, May to September, is um, is up about 16%. So soils that are that have developed on these landforms and that and that uh, depth to restrictive layer are causing these sites to flood out. There's a perched water table, and we can see this in the growth form of some of the trees that they've got a these buttressed roots. Uh, it's very pronounced throughout this area of the park. So the lack of slope in combination with this perched water table are, are impeding lateral drainage. Where there is lateral drainage by those gullies, we're not experiencing die off, but we're, we're seeing water ponded on the surface into June, um, especially in the period from 2013 to about 2020. So what do we expect for the future? Uh, what is the wet trend is the new normal. Um, models suggest that we're going to have drier periods, but we're also going to to have these wetter periods, and these wetter periods are probably going to come in the form of these larger rainfall events. <clears throat> and um, so some of these these areas are transitioning into community types that are no longer capable of supporting that suite of species that we we kind of perceive as typical big woods, you know, those characteristic species, the maples, the basswoods, the red oaks. Um, and we're transitioning in this case to monotypic stands of ash. Well, as Marcella pointed out, ash borer is, is affecting this state now. And um, we've got emerald ash borer documented within six miles of the park on either side. So it's something that we need to make considerations for. So, Managing the site, in, a, in terms of managing the site in a wet future, um, we started to ask ourselves, well, how do we plan for this? How do we restore for this? Is the goal to preserve, restore, or, or replace? Um, restoration, again, site conditions, uh, the hydrology of the area is no longer capable of supporting that native plant community that we, we were accustomed to. But it does provide a great opportunity to do some adaptive climate adaptive management and it also allowed us some great opportunities to do some research or make these partnerships to kind of um, try to dig further into uh, what are some 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 reasonable um, management strategies. So we started to consider, well, we've got quite a bit of this landscape that's affected. Do we do a do nothing approach? And what would that look like? More of a hands on approach would possibly result in um, some of these sites converting to wet meadows, especially if uh, emerald ash borer came in and wiped out the, the green ash regeneration at some point. We also deal with reed canary grass, as most folks who live along floodplains know that can be a significant problem. It can really stifle um, um, reforestation in these in these settings. Uh, and, and, and somebody pointed out earlier that, well, uh, as we lose these overstory trees, we, we have effects on the hydrology, loss of evapotranspiration. Are we gonna flood out some areas even more? Um, so do we wanna start planting more water tolerant trees instead of our typical big woods trees? So we started looking into some ideas of assisted migration um, or assisted range expansion using more tolerant species, Southern varieties like swamp white oak or bottomland baroque, a subspecies or a variety of uh, baroque. 
Um, or do we want do we want to try out using some some um, some elm stock that was developed through the University of uh, Minnesota's elm selection program and see if we can reintroduce elm onto the landscape in, in light of uh, Dutch elms disease. And the thing we were up against in, in the Division of Parks and Trails is that um, we have a state statute for managing these sites to historic or pre-European settlement conditions. And this, in, in this case, was no longer possible. So in 2019, we set up a novel community planting trial where we were moving floodplain or terrace type species up into uh, these high upland settings on the park. Um, in uh, 2019, we ended up bringing in 780 hardwood uh, seedlings. These were bare root stock, 2030 stock. Um, so this is two year or three year old stock out of the planting bed. Uh, we created four 1.25 acre plots uh, and we planted them at a random distribution across. They each got s similar treatments. It was set up as a randomized block. We were also looking at uh, differences in browse treatment on overall survival, as well as weed, weed barriers on overall survival. Uh, we collected one and three year growth metrics and survival metrics and uh, had a undergraduate student researcher do some soil sampling and soil analysis. Um, in the 1990s, we were lucky enough to have several releve plots or these vegetation sampling plots, um, ecological sampling plots across the park. Uh, and we were able to select a few of these in both affected and non-affected areas and resample those, which we completed in 2020. Um, and then we were kind of on a campaign to try to inform the public. We were starting to get a lot of questions about what was going on. So just a, a little summary of survival rates, um, the three-year survival rates for different species. We had some winners and losers. Uh, survival for silver maple was high, as you can see, a, a pushing 80%, cottonwood 85%. Oddly, hatberry was moderate, 35 and swamp white oak was kind of a loser here at um, 18%. The deal with the swamp white oak was, I think it was, uh, a uh, plant material issue, a stock issue. The stock wasn't very good. Um, hackberry, I'm not quite sure there. We did have a wet year. We ended up planting in early June uh, for, for these trials. And uh, the elm stock we planted was all one to three gallon containerized. And to date, and there's a picture of one on the right there, but to date we have 100% survival of that. And some of them are about 15 feet tall. Uh, so we've got good growth and good survival on those. We also did collect stem caliper measurements, but I'm not going to present that here. Um, just uh, I'm going to blow through this one, but uh, overall survival rates, as you can see, we have a healthy deer population, especially overwintering in the park. Uh, tree protection is necessary, um, and the weed barrier definitely helps as well. Um, we did use corn residue mats. Uh, plastic mats or none, but um, I think the, the main thing is tree protection is, is necessary in some of these settings, especially if you're in that kind of urban interface. So following that in 2023, we did an additional five acre bottomland oak, bur bottomland bur oak planting, which I would consider kind of an assisted range migration, pushing the range of that variety a little farther north. So in uh, the winter of 22, 23, we with the uh, help of Conservation Corps, uh, I we cleared out that area, cut all cut and treated all the ash regeneration, uh, planted two thousand bottomland baroque seedlings. These were two O and three O bare root stock, um, and uh, sourced out of southeast Iowa. We purchased them from the Iowa DNR nursery. Uh, very good looking stock, um, and. Um, they should be more tolerant of, of getting their, their feet wet. Um, so we tubed 1,600 of them, as you can see in this picture, uh, and 400 were not tubed, but we had them flagged. We want to do some um, surveys to look at browse impacts in subsequent years. So just one thing to point out for people considering this is seedlings are cheap. 2-0 seedlings, 90 cents a piece, 3-0 seedlings, that's three years in the planting bed, no secondary planting bed. 
um, but good looking, fairly decent sized stock, three foot tall. Um, they're a dollar ten a piece. So seedling cost per acre came out to about four hundred forty dollars, but supply costs, the tubes, um, and this doesn't include labor, is comes out to about two thousand dollars an acre. So just a few takeaways that we kind of came away with after after doing these trials. Um, and to date, we've got about 23 acres planted between some direct hardwood seedings we've done in affected areas, but also um, just bare root stock planting. Um, we can anticipate more water on the landscape, but it's not maybe always going to be wet. We'll still have some of these drier periods, but we can expect more of our precipitation to come in these larger events. Um, certain plant communities, and this is a big take takeaway for us, um, for me as a as a land manager, but also for uh, people in my division, uh, is that some communities lie in a very precarious spot on the landscape. They're not static, and just a little change can can cause these stand replacing events, which we're we're forced to deal with, and we need to be looking ahead at some of these other uh, secondary effects like emerald ash borer or other invasives. Um, these vegetation shifts can occur uh, quite rapidly, um, and in this case, it was over the course of a decade or less where where these were realized, um, and then it just presents some challenges to the public. Uh, restoration, adaptation, and the perception of that and, and where we're going. And again, other management management considerations do need to factor in some of these, these other variables like, um, you know, uh, emerald ash borer, changes in hydrology, uh, and losses of species on the landscape. So a lot of unknowns still remain. And with that, I'll end. I just want to um, acknowledge the Clean Water Legacy Amendment for funding this and the partnerships with the U, uh, Ryan Murphy with the Elm Selection Program, Chad Giblin, who was formerly with the U, Katie Connolly did the soils work, and then I wanted to thank the Conservation Corps of Minnesota and Iowa for helping me out with all their hard work to get these sites uh, prepped and planted. It's a lot of work. Thank goodness for Conservation Corps, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, we have a, a few questions uh, and please feel free to add questions to the Q&A and those will be dropped in and uh, we'll get to some of those as you continue to add those. Um, so I guess one of the questions I'd like to ask is, um, we'll start with, um, with Marcella. Marcella, how often do you um, find that a particular tree species breaks the rules that we think we understand for a plant. So this applies to Neil as well. Like, um, you know, we think that elm and ash can tolerate wet conditions, but how often do you find that, you know, we just, the rules that we think we know are broken? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Julia. And that's one that we're kind of continually learning. And I think it goes back to how we know a tree or how we know a plant. Um, and so, uh, from a Western forestry lens, a lot of how we know plants relates to um, the lens that we were managing for us, which was really related to growing trees to build cities or growing trees after a really exploitive cutover period um, and then post-World War boom. And so we were really thinking about growing trees for products within the U.S. And so we know those trees from a commercial standpoint, from an economic lens. Um, but there's so many different other ways to know that tree too. And as we, as Western science moves into climate adaptation with forestry, which they've been doing for over 40 years, we're seeing this broader range of how we understand trees or their adaptability. Um, and it's often, um, surprising how, especially when a tree becomes mature, that large tree, they can tolerate a pretty wide range of conditions, but it's those new seedlings or germinants that can really struggle um, when we think about climate adaptation. So we're continually learning about a lot of our species. And so Neil, you might beg to differ. You had your mature trees and then they're all dying. Um, can you comment on how, how what that process might have actually entailed? So was it kind of about the anaerobic conditions and then how will young trees tolerate those conditions that you're planting them into than if the mature trees couldn't tolerate those conditions? 
Unmute yourself, Neil. There you yep. go. And, you know, that's why we were kind of going with the selection of species we did is the idea that we would move, move some of these species um, off their typical location where we typically think of them on the landscape and into these settings that now have, have changed. These soils that we planted in are all listed as potentially hydric. They're on the hydric soils list. So they, they don't drain well. Um, so when we, we started to make considerations, you know, we do see some natural regeneration. We, we would leave some of that natural regeneration of hickory, just not knowing, knowing the fate beyond a certain point. So um, part of uh, the issue of some of these forest types, especially in the big woods forest type, is you need some level of disturbance to regenerate that oak component. Um, we need some opening in the canopy. We're not getting, now we're getting an entire opening in the canopy, but immediate competition, immediate shade out, you know, and you could almost tell which, which areas were disturbed and when they were disturbed or which areas were affected by flooding and when they were affected by flooding by looking at the regeneration age. So, I mean, just coming back to it is, yeah, we, we say we can't just go with a, a straight up red oak planting because the likelihood of a straight red oak plant, and, and we have done some of that, but the likelihood of survival past a certain point um, probably is, is substantially reduced. So moving some of these species, silver maples and things that we would typically see uh, in a floodplain setting um, kind of made more sense to us considering that they were gonna be possibly standing in water until June. I'm gonna go back to Marcella with the question. Um, so, and this will, I'm gonna throw this out to both of you, but thinking about the um, seed bed preparation and competition then, so it's maybe a, a little bit of a seed bed preparation and that environmental conditions from your triangle, Marcella. Um, how does the lack of diverse ground layer vegetation um, affect, you know, the regeneration that we expect to, or you're trying to, striving to achieve? Yeah, no, that changes in ground layer, especially on species that um, are considered invasive or weedy or like those shifts really uh, influence kind of that regeneration environment. So um, the highest level of mortality for tree species happens those first few years. So um, and if we think about what that means, it often means more necessary intentional um, treatments. So if we think about buckthorn or garlic mustard or reed canary grass, those can be really intensive treatments to control those populations enough to allow regeneration. Or hopefully if we get trees, in a lot of these cases, we can get shade and then we can have enough in that seed bank for other species to come back or at least have conditions where restoration of other ground layer species or shrub species can be more successful. But it's it's a huge change um, in our ecosystems in terms of like, what does that mean for the treatments we're doing? And also Neil mentioned like, it feels really great to plant a seedling. People love planting seedlings. We have so many uh, planting events, but it's really that care and protection and stewardship after a seedling is planted that allows that seedling to move into an overstory or into a canopy position. So really that success depends on that actions often afterwards. Uh, that was another question was, how do you define the break point between um, you've seeded it and then it recruits into the canopy? So that regeneration versus recruitment, what's the break point there? Yeah, and so that's gonna differ in a lot in in different systems, and um, for a lot of systems, it's related to deer, and so um, deer are often considered um, a potential browser until a tree is over seven or eight feet, and depending on snow levels, that could be a lot higher. Um, but deer is often that, um, and so often if a tree reaches that. 10, 12, 15 feet, we can consider to establish. Um, but Neil might have more experience in along floodplains, those trees um, may be safe from deer, uh, but beaver can still be an issue. And so it's all thinking about um, kind of once that tree is in a position where 
um, we kind of move past that survival curve of like, okay, they're established and they're likely going to continue surviving um, unless, as Neil has seen, really big changes. So really getting to that big tipping points that cause overstory mortality. Neil, I'm going to throw a different question at you, and it's going to be two of them. Um, did you have... There, Emerald Ash Borer has been around long enough in some areas that there might be some examples for how to move on beyond Emerald Ash Borer, you know, restoration strategies for that. So have you looked at any examples from other areas that are guiding your restoration process? And then tie in with that, um, whether or not it might be better to just not have a forested system and do, you know, if, if we want climate resilience in this ecosystem, maybe an herbaceous plant community would be more appropriate. You know, I think there was, when we started this work, there was a lot of subsequent work. Um, I know there was work on black ash going on up north at the same time and and, and some of these larger scale um, experimental, experimental type forestry projects. So, um, you know, it was kind of this concurrent evolution of the, the process. <laughs> we were doing it without thinking, but we were kind of doing the same thing. Um, you know, and we, realistically, and I'm hoping I'm answering this, but we we're not going to be able to address the whole whole area we're we're looking at. Um, you know, and and we did throw out some pretty wet, wacky ideas like installing drain tile through the forest and manipulating hydrology to try to preserve some of these areas. Uh, really heavy-handed approaches, but. Um, you know, we are going to let some areas just kind of naturally progress as the, as they will. Um, again, a, a big concern for us was the amount of work that comes in when a system gets replaced. If we do transition to more of a, a wet meadow type community, are we going to end up creating a monoculture of the reed canary grass, as I indicated in my slide? And people who plant in floodplain settings know the kind of know the struggle with with working with that species it's rhizomatous it's it's pr pretty <laughs> it's difficult to deal with it produces a lot of seed and that seed manages to move across the landscape pretty efficiently so um you know what we don't want to do is is just let that go and if we're observing that as the pattern where we're we're kind of reducing ourselves to a, a monoculture of something that is is hard to fight back from. So, you know, taking off these bites and, and reasonable bites at a time and trying to do it that way made sense to us. And I may have kind of danced around that question quite a bit there. <laughs> That's all right. It was a broad question. Julia, can I jump in too? Yes, please do. Uh, with um, EAB having been um, around for a while. Um, so there is work out of Michigan seeing after that first initial kind of impact from EAB, um, there was some hypothesis or hope that population levels might kind of uh, pull back enough to allow ash to regenerate. Um, it doesn't sound like that's the case. Uh, there's a really great Silvacast uh, podcast episode that um, talks with those researchers from Michigan and Ohio and talks about kind of some of those impacts as well as um, in those systems, there are ash that are still around. So um, there are hope for some resistant or resilient ash there. So that that is there. Um, but it's EAB is didn't the population density of the insect did not um, collapse enough to allow um, kind of that re return. It just allowed uh, continued infestation once those trees got to the size. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Neil, we have one minute left. Can you kind of talk about your expectations for being able to kind of financially um, pull off restoration over the extent of the area that you would need to do that? Yeah, you know, we we look at this as, as you know, five acres, five to 10 acres is annually kind of the amount we, we shoot for. The, the other problem is some of these areas are actively expanding. <laughs> so, you know, we've, we've, since we mapped it, we've observed a, a kind of radiating outward pattern a, a little farther. So, you know, financially, 
you know, five to 10 acres is doable within, you know, my, one of my fiscal years and with the budget I have, again, we're not contracting out this work. I, at, at some point it would be nice uh, at a larger scale to do this, but, you know, really we've been relying on, and I shouldn't say we're not contracting it out. We're using contracts through conservation Corps, So we're using but we're also actively on the site doing the work with them. So we're, we're planting these all together. We're, we're doing the site prep all together. Um, there's a lot of large, uh, I mean, we've got sensitive resources out there. So some of the equipment use is, as well as a lot of downwoody debris, larger downwoody debris, um, as well as standing debris. So it's equipment feasibility, you know, if we did that, it would move it into a different level. Um, so, so there's a lot of logistics to consider in addition to just the uh, the cost of replacing trees yeah. and putting them in. It's yep, and you need to scale that up. Process. So, it's good what good redheaded woodpecker habitat right now. <laughs> all right, we are at one o'clock. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And uh, remember that we have two additional um, webinars coming up. So you can register for those if you have not already on the link that we provided earlier. Um, so check that out in the chat really quick before you log off if you forgot to get it and you are not yet registered. And thanks very much to our two speakers today. Really appreciate your time and expertise. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks for the great questions.